Welcome to The House Online. My name is Devin, and I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for service today. If you're new here and you are wanting to get connected with us, I want to invite you to text the house to 94000. That's going to let someone on our team reach out to you and get to know a little bit more about you and let you know how you can be a part of what God is doing here at the house. Well, at this time, we are going to go ahead and get ready to go into worship. So if you can, stand up on your feet with me and let's worship. Forever and ever, how great your name. Your love remains. Forever and ever, you stay the same. Shout it out, shout it out, shout it out if you know he's good. Sing it out, sing it out for the Lord is good. Shout it out loud, you are glorious. Come on. Glorious. Shout it out and glorious. Make it louder. Jesus, we shout your name. Jesus, we make your praise. God, you reign, my God, forever, forever, forever and ever. How great, how great your name. Your love remains, your love remains. Forever, forever, forever and ever. You stay the same. Shout it out. Shout it out, shout it out, if you know he's good. Sing it out, sing it out, for the Lord is good. Shout it out loud, you are glorious. Glorious. Shout it out. Shout it out and glorious. Make it louder. Jesus, Jesus, we shout your name. God, you are glorious. Yes, you are. We sing, oh God. Shine, Jesus, you shine for all the world to see. You are glorious. Come on, sing it out if you know it. Shine, Jesus, you shine for all the world to see. You are glorious. We sing, shine, shine, Jesus. You shine for all the world to see. You are glorious. Come on. You are glorious. If you are new to the house today, or maybe you've just been coming for a while now, we want to get to know you. So one way to do that is to come visit our team uh, members at the end of the service back here in our next steps room. Uh, we'd love just to get to know you guys. That's right. Also, we want you to know about Framework. Framework is a class that um, occurs the first three Sundays yep. of every month. Yep. Um, it's at 11.15 and 4 o'clock. 
Uh, the third serve, the third um, section is today. Yeah. So if you are anywhere in your phase of framework, go ahead and join that one. We want you to do that. And framework is a great way yeah. for you to get to know the DNA and the culture of the house. Yeah. And today's um, section is really interesting because it's about you and getting yeah. to know you. So go ahead and put that on your calendar and plan to do that. Yeah, so good. Well, today's also a very exciting day today because it is Recruitment Sunday Woo! for Life Groups. Life Groups are such a huge part of the culture here at the house. And uh, we want you to get it, some more information on it. So there is a table out in the foyer and just come visit us and get some more info out there. That's right. Also, baptisms are coming Woo! up. Yes. Baptisms are on the schedule for August 29th. Yes. So if you have made the decision to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, we want to celebrate that with you. It's a very, yeah. very important thing to do, to yeah. follow your salvation in baptism. Yeah. So if you need to do that or want to do that, please go back to the next steps room after the service so that we can put that on the schedule. Yeah. That's all the announcements we have for y'all today. Please stand up and welcome someone to the house. never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will see of the goodness of god i love your voice you have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you like a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Oh, my all my life you have been faithful in all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able i will see of the goodness of god oh my life oh my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that i am able oh i will see of the goodness of god Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful. Come on, 
sing it out this morning. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing, I will sing of the goodness of God. trust into. And the reason why I love this song is that it says God's love is a firm foundation. It doesn't move. It doesn't shake. It can't be easily broken. And in this world, there's a lot of things you can put your trust in. There's a lot of things you can put your hope in. You can put it in the number in your bank account. You can put it in the amount of degrees you have. You can put it into your kids. Come on, you can put it into all the things that are in your control. But there's one thing that doesn't move. There's one thing that isn't shaking. And that is the love of God. You know, Jesus was telling, telling, giving this sermon, and at the end of his sermon, he goes, hey, there, there were two builders. There were two builders who built homes, and, and one of them, they built their house on sand, and the other one built their house on a rock. Now, I'm not um, a contractor. I'm not an architect. I don't know a whole lot about building, but I do know that building something on sand is not a good idea. <laughs> and this guy builds his house on sand, and when the waves of life came, it destroyed his house. And so if you build your life on all those other things that I listed, while some of those are good things, you won't be able to withstand adversity. And the thing about adversity is that it's going to come. It's not like if it's going to happen, it's when it happens. It's not if you're going to get a flat tire, it's when you're going to get a flat tire. It's not when you're going to get an extra bill that you didn't expect, it's when it's going to come. Like it, adversity comes for us all. And so if we're not careful, we'll build our lives on something that can't withstand adversity. And I want to tell you today that, come on, even, I don't know what you built your life on last week or this whole last year, but today you can make the decision to say, you know what, I'm not going to build my life on those things anymore. I'm going to build my life on the thing that can sustain me. And so my name is Devin, and I get to lead us into this next part of our service, which is where we give. And we do that now because we see giving as a part of our, our, of our worship. Like we see this as we're making our hearts obedient to what God has asked us to do. And anytime you do that, come on, that's worship. And so the ways to give are going to be on the screen. And then if you're going to give cash or check, you can do that on the way out today with the boxes on the wall. And if this is your first time, we don't want anything from you. This service is a blessing to you. But as we move forward, the other thing you're going to see is families come together and pray. You're going to see friends come together and pray. And that's because we want you to have a moment in church 
where you connect with God. I know that's so crazy. But we want you to actually pray and have a moment with God where you can say, you know what? I have been building my life on some other things. But today, me and my family, me and my friends, we're deciding that we're going to switch our focus and we're going to focus back on you. And so I'm going to pray. And then I would encourage you to pray with the people that you came with. God, we thank you that you're a firm foundation. That when an unexpected doctor's report, when an unexpected moment happens, when we come up against adversity, when we build our lives on you, when we build our lives on the things that you've said, come on, it's a firm foundation. It's something that we can trust. Come on, we can trust you, God. I feel like there's some people in this room who need to know that they can trust you, God. So God, as we give and as we pray together, God, we give you our hearts. We put all of our eggs in your basket. God, the greatest investment we can make is one in a relationship with you. So God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No matter what it looks like, God, we choose to trust you, God. We choose to trust you, God. No matter what it looks like, we choose to trust you. We choose to trust you, God. Above it all and through it all, God. Above it all and through it all, God. Above it all and through it all, God. We choose to trust you. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not I be will be What's up, House family? Listen, Pastor Stephen here. On the last week 
of our kind of time of just refreshing, being with the Lord, being in the presence of the Holy Spirit, praying, thinking about our future. And so I just want to appreciate you guys uh, for allowing us to have this time to refuel, to connect. Listen, our kids have been at camp for two weeks. So Katie and I, listen, we've been dating. We've been falling in love all over again. I'm like, this is what we have to come on. To look forward to, but we are in Hot Springs picking up our kids now. We head to Dayton, Texas to drop off our oldest son, uh, Trevor, and Noah, who plays electric guitar. They are doing a three-week internship at a, a ranch, and come on, ain't nothing like country muscle, and so they are learning uh, on a ranch, so we're excited about that. I'll be ministering there Sunday morning. And then uh, we'll be back next Sunday. So you don't want to miss. Come on, I'm ready. I feel like God has given us clear direction on where we're headed. I can't wait to give, give you an update on where we are with the building. So don't miss next Sunday. Two weeks ago, we started a sermon series called Make It Plain. And come on, didn't Stephen Hill do a great job last week? Stephen looking like Stephen Denzel uh, up here looking slick, silky smooth. But anyway, he had a great word for us. Devin, two weeks ago, had a great word. And so here's the deal. We thought we would bring Rev Dev back to end this sermon series. And so come on, y'all get your notes together. Get your amens. Tell him, make it plain because we believe that God has a word for you. You know, God is simple and God is clear and God is direct. And we are the ones sometimes that confuse what he means. And so I'm just praying that the Holy Spirit would impart just a very simple concept, a simple idea. You would take away one sentence that you could marinate on for the next week. We love you and we cannot wait to see you. Y'all give a big hand to Devin Cheatwood. Well, come on. Hey, I know I said this last week, but can we just put our hands together for our awesome pastors? Come on. Well, if you are new, if you started coming in like the last month or so, you're probably like, the pastor never preaches at this church. <laughs> I promise that he does, but they've been on vacation, so they've been hanging out, and it's a much-needed vacation, and so we're excited uh, to have them back. And so Pastor Stephen will be preaching next week, so come back, because if you don't like this one, that one's going to be so much better than this. <laughs> also, if you don't like something that I say, you can actually email me, okay, at Stephen with a P-H at WelcomeToTheHouse.com, and we would love to get with you and, and talk about that. Um, but yeah, go ahead and email me. But we have been in this Make It Plain series, and I'm so excited about this series. I loved hearing uh, Stephen Hill speak last week about the talents. Come on, it convicted me. I was like, okay, I got to go home and figure out how many talents I have. How can I double them while I wait on Jesus to come back? And so it's been a good series. And today I'm going to wrap us up by talking about the parable of the prodigal son. And so I know a lot of us have heard this story over and over. We've heard this story a lot. But today, I want us to focus more on the father than we do on the son. Because I think that um, a lot of times we can make it about the son. We can make the story all about the son. But I actually want to look at the father and how he responds to his son. And so I was thinking about dadhood, okay? Dadhood is the best hood. Where's all my dads at? Where's my... Okay, that, let, me, let me just help y'all, fellas. If I would have said where all my mom's at, it would have been a pandemonium, okay? They would have been like, whoa, we're right here, let's go. So when I say where all the dad's at, I'm expecting some bass to come this way. And uh, I got to, woo. It's like, do you like being a dad or not? Like, so where are my dad's at? Woo. Okay, they, they, I felt it in my chest that time. That's, that's what I'm talking about. I was thinking about dadhood, and I have a three-year-old. He's turning three on Monday, so obviously I'm a professional, Nick. You know, <laughs> I could teach you a thing or two. No, no, I'm just kidding. Nick has like four kids. He's a superhero. Um, but I was thinking about all the things they don't tell you about being a dad before you become a dad. Now, I read books. I read books about parenting uh, a toddler. I read books about parenting a newborn, but there were some things that they, they just didn't make it in the book. So maybe I'm going to write a book and put these things in there. <laughs> But they don't tell you how terrible your kid's timing is, okay? Let me explain to you. Kids always get sick right before it's time to go on vacation. <laughs> they always get sick right before it's time to go on vacation. They always, they always are hungry right before it's time to go to bed. It's like, if it's time to go to sleep, and now you're hungry. You want something to eat. I'm going to give you something to eat. You better go to sleep. Go to sleep. Go to bed, and you won't be hungry. Just go to bed. 
they always wait until you're sitting down and ready to watch your show, and now it's time to watch Bubble Gubbies. <laughs> Woo! It's okay, it's cool. I don't want to watch anything. You could just have the TV. I just, I just know every song. Right now, my son, is he likes Turbo, okay? So if you don't know what Turbo is, it's this movie about a really fast snail, and it was cool the first five times, but now we're on time 20 in the last three days, and I'm sick of it, okay? So you can watch it at your house. They don't tell you how bad your kid's Tommy is going to be. One thing that I learned, though, is why a restroom is actually called a restroom. See, when I was young, I thought, that's weird that we call it a restroom because, you know, you just go there and do your business or take a bath or something. So I could get bathroom, but why do we call it a restroom? Oh, (laughs) I have learned why they call it a restroom. (laughs) Because now, 90% of the time, when I am in the bathroom, I am actually just resting. (laughs) I am just sitting there, staring at the shower, doing absolutely nothing. And I know when I've been in there too long, because I'll get a text from my wife, Sydney, and she'll go, are you okay? (laughs) And really, I want to say, no, I'm not okay. (laughs) But I just go, yeah, I'll be out in a few minutes, because Malachi, my son, has been running me through the house all day, and I just need a break. So I just say, hey, daddy got to go potty. And I just (laughs) go in there for like 30 or 40 minutes. They don't tell you how much you're going to have to fight for your wife's love against this three-year-old, okay? And if you don't believe me, just go to Sydney's Instagram. I'm not keeping tally, but he got way more posts about him in the last three years than I have about me. I didn't know I was going to have to fight him off for the affection of my wife. When we sit by each other, he wants to come and sit right in the middle. And if I was a terrible dad, if I was a mean dad, if I was a bad dad, I would pick him up and toss him across the living room and go sit down. But I don't do that because I'm saved and sanctified and all that, and I can't do that. <laughs> they didn't tell me I was going to have my manhood tested. And maybe if you just have girls, this, part, this may not happen to you. But when you have a son, he says no when I say yes. And I'm like, oh, so we're about to fight right now. I will fight a three-year-old. I will take you in the backyard, and we will throw hands. I am not playing with you. I also didn't know I was going to have to fight for my food. And this is the last thing. This is a big surprise to me. Most people think I'm skinny because I work out. (laughs) No, I don't. (laughs) Most people think I'm skinny because maybe I'm on some sort of diet where I like to eat salad and stuff. No, I actually do not. I go to McDonald's three times a week. And one day, that's going to catch up to me, and I will stop then. But right now, I just just like it. (laughs) The reason I'm skinny is because every time I get food, he thinks that he has food. And it's always, Daddy, can I have some of your French fries? I bought you french fries. I would have bought you more french fries if I would have known you were going to eat all of mine. (laughs) Daddy, can I have some of your burger? And so it doesn't matter where he's at in the house. I can try to open it real quietly in the corner of my room, and I hit the little feet. (laughs) Daddy, I want some. You don't want nothing. You You don't even know what this is. I'm about to cover everything in hot sauce so that he won't need anything else from me. No, obviously, I'm joking, and I love being a dad, but there's some things about being a dad that they don't tell you. And as we look at this father and this story that Jesus is going to tell, I wonder if he knew that his son, the prodigal son, was going to come to him and say, hey, I want half of everything. I don't want to be in a relationship with you. I just want your stuff. I just want what you can give me. And so as we get ready to go to the story, which is in Luke chapter 15, and you guys can go ahead and turn there while I'm setting everything up. Um... I have to ask myself, why is Jesus telling this story? And the thing about it was the Pharisees did not think that Jesus should be hanging out with the people that he was hanging out with, okay? And so if I was a spiritual leader in this time, I probably would have been conflicted as well because here this man is, he's awesome, he's doing miracles, he's claiming that he's the son of God, he's super holy, like he's perfect, but he's hanging out with some people that I don't think he should be associated with. And so when Jesus would come into a village, he would heal blind people. He would heal lame people. He would heal sick people. He would be with tax collectors. And after healing these people, they would throw parties. Come on. So Jesus would be in the parties. And these parties would be top notch. Everybody who was everybody was at these parties. And when the Pharisees saw Jesus mingling with these people, they were like, now hold up. This doesn't add up because you're supposed to be holy. And from our perspective, if you were holy, You would just be hanging out with people that are like us. You would just be hanging out with other holy people. But here you are surrounding yourself with all of these people who don't look like us, who don't think like us, who we actually think are doing the wrong thing, who are sinners and tax collectors. Nobody likes tax collectors. I don't answer the phone for bill collectors. Come on. (laughs) But Jesus is hanging out with these people. And so Jesus tells them two stories. The first story he tells them 
is a story about a shepherd, okay? Now, this shepherd has 100 sheep. 100 sheep, that's a lot of sheep. I don't have that kind of land to be able to have 100 sheep, but somehow he has collected 100 sheep. Now, in this time, that would have been like a lot of wealth. That would have been a lot of money because you can do a lot with sheep. But he loses one. He loses one. So in my mind, hey, you still got 99? This sheep obviously does not want to be here. Why don't you just let him go do his deal and keep these 99? But the shepherd does something that's crazy. He leaves the 99. It doesn't say he goes and gets someone to watch them for him. It doesn't say he waits till they're all asleep. It just says that the shepherd leaves the 99 to go after this one lost sheep. And he, found, and he finds him. And when he comes back, he throws a party. He celebrates. It's like, whoa, I found my sheep. And if I'm a Pharisee, at this point, I'm like, okay, that's a sheep. That kind of costs money. So you got to make it, you got to make it more plain for me, Jesus. You got to tell me, give me another story. So Jesus starts talking about this woman with coins. This woman has 10 coins. I don't know how much the coins are worth, but I'm assuming they're worth a lot because she loses one and she goes crazy. She flips everything up and down the house. Come on. I lost my wedding ring once and I was like panicking, trying to find it. I was like, oh, I got to find it before Cindy find out because you're going to kill me. We turned everything, and I didn't find it. That's why I got this rubber one right now, but it's, it's cool. <laughs> but this lady flips her whole house upside down. In my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm going to just wait till I do the laundry because the coins always show up when I do my laundry. But she goes all through her house, sweeps it clean, and she finds it, and she throws a block party. She invites her friends. She invites her neighbors. Now, I'm not the most mathematically gifted person on the planet, but I can do simple math, okay? If you throw a party for the whole neighborhood, that's going to cost more than the coin that you just found. I just threw a third birthday party. Not even like a sweet 16. And it cost more than a coin. (laughs) It cost me a coin to get him from my house to the park. (laughs) It cost it a lot to throw this party. And here she is spending more money than what she found to celebrate finding this coin. And I think what Jesus is trying to convey to the Pharisees is that when sinners show up, when lost people show up, God shows out. So when you come back to God, when you come back to the Father, when you come back into the house, God goes overboard because that's how much he loves us. And so my title today is not the prodigal son, but the prodigal dad. Because when we hear prodigal, we think of somebody who ran off or somebody who didn't live up to their parents' expectations, or somebody who didn't fit the bill of what people thought they were going to do. But prodigal actually means extravagant, lavish, over the top. It just means more than what is necessary. And so if anything in this story sticks out to me as prodigal, it's the love that this dad shows his son. It's the, it's the way that he forgives him and shows him grace. And in the Bible, in 1 John, it says, what lavish love the father has shown to us that we will be called children of God. So I'm hoping that today we could see that together. So turn with me to Luke chapter 15, verse 11. And let me just show you how I like to read the Bible. I have to make stuff make sense for me, okay? So I may spend a little time on one verse, and I'm trying to read the whole thing. And so if you were in, like, quiet time with me, you would be like, okay, we've been here for an hour, and we only read one verse. I'm sorry. I'm a slow learner like that. I have to read it and break it down. And so I'm not going to make you sit here for an hour, but read through this with me. So verse 11 says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Come on, anybody here have a younger sibling? Okay, don't younger siblings always, don't look at them right now if they're with you. Don't younger siblings always get away with more? It's almost like you were raised by two completely different parents. Like the things that my mom told me to do and the things that my mom tells my younger siblings, which I have seven of them to do, and she has just progressively gotten easier on each seven. <laughs> the things that she told me to do and the things that she told them to do are completely different. I'm like, I don't even know this woman. She hasn't picked up a belt in like five years. And I'm like, <laughs> you got a different mama. This ain't the same person. Younger siblings always get away with more. And so I also have to ask myself, where was the mama? Okay. Where was mom in all of this, of this son coming and asking for all this stuff? Because if he had a mama like my mama, when I walked into the room and even thought about opening my mouth to say, hey, go ahead and sell all your stuff and give me half, she would have slapped me so hard (laughs) that I would have forgot while I was in the room and just started cleaning up something. I just just came in here to sweep your flow. Now, I'm not saying that's the best way to parent, okay? I've been through freedom and all that, and you should sign up for one of those life groups if you need to. 
But what was the mama? Because this young man was being disrespectful. See, this wasn't just, hey, give me some extra allowance. This was the same as him saying, hey, dad, it would be better for me if you were just dead so that I could have half of your stuff. Because he would have had to wait until his father was dead in order to get his estate. So can you imagine how hurt this dad would feel, like the amount of pain that this would cause it? I started to think about Malachi coming into my room and going, you know, dad, I think you need to sell all your stuff and get half. First of all, you're not getting anything for me. You can get out of my face. That's it. But instead of disowning his son, which this man could have completely done and, be, and been well within his right, this man knows that, that the, the one way to have a relationship with his son is maybe to just go ahead and do what he's asked. Because maybe, just maybe, he'll go off and do his thing, but he'll come back to him. Maybe there's a chance for there to be a relationship, because right now there's obviously not much of one. See, this wasn't just a piece of land, though. This was his net worth. This was his life savings. In fact, it probably was passed down generation to generation, because back then it wasn't like you would just do a random job. You would be what your dad was. So right now, if Malachi grows up and wants to be a veterinarian for whatever reason, he can fully do that. Go to school, do it. You can... Get sick animals and heal them for some reason, if you would want to do that. He doesn't have to be in ministry like his dad. But back then, it was if your dad was a priest, then you were a priest. If your dad was a carpenter, then you were a carpenter. If your dad was a shepherd, you were a shepherd. So this had been passed down through the family, and now he's saying, I don't care about any of that. I don't care about you. I just want my stuff. And without hesitation, without arguing, without going back and forth, the father divides it, and somehow he bankrupts himself for a spoiled child. Verse 13. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. Uh Uh-oh. See, at the beginning of this verse, oh, he's feeling like Mr. Moneybags. Come on, he got his money, he got everything that he has, and he is living wild. I don't know what he did. Maybe he went to the casino. Maybe he was on drugs. Maybe he was partying. I don't know what he did with this time that he had, but all I know is that he wasted it, okay? And let me just put a little side note here and just encourage you to not spend everything that you have. Like, if you make $750 a week and you get that on Friday, try to have not 0.00 in your account on Monday, Because just like I said in the offering, it's not a matter of if adversity comes. It's not a matter of if somebody gets laid off or if you lose a job. It's just when. It's just when the bad thing is going to happen, when the tire is going to go flat, when your son is going to punch a hole or something into your wall and you're going to have to get that whole thing repaired. It's a matter of when. So don't spend everything you have. But that's just a side note. But here this young man is, and he's ruined the relationship with his dad, basically, to chase after pleasure. And the thing that I know about sin is that it's pleasurable for a season. Come on, it's fun for a season. Don't sit up here and act like sinning is not fun for a season. And you always have people with you that are hyping you up. I bet he had like a crew. Like, yeah, this is my boy. Hey, he got the money. Put it on his tab. Yeah, yeah. He got it. But when he went broke, there was obviously no one there because there's famine and he's in need. So there's no one to give him a pallet to sleep on on their floor. There's no one to even make my boy a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. He is in need all alone because people will be with you. Come on, when you live in high and mighty and you just got the money. But then when you're in your lowest moments, you'll find out, well, who is really my friend? Who is really for me? As we keep reading in verse 15, it says, So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Now, I know we're in Razorback country, okay? I'm from Louisiana, so it's LSU till I die, you know, but don't attack me after this. I still love y'all. And y'all, you like to call the hogs. But if I started to talk to you about feeding the hogs, you'd probably be like, eh, you had to call somebody else. If you call me thinking that I'm going to come to your farm, and help you feed hogs, you have another thing coming. I can pray for your hogs from here. I can do a lot of things, but I cannot help you feed the hogs, let alone. Now, I'm pretty polite. So if you invite me over to your house, and you just cook something that I don't like, like like if you make some coleslaw, and you just slap it down on the plate, and you're like, hey, we got coleslaw today. I'm going to at least pretend to like it, and I'm just going to nibble on it, be like, "Mm, you know, this is so good, but I ate before I came, so I can't really finish. (laughs) Y'all do that, too. Don't judge me. I see the judgmental (laughs) stairs. But if you were to say, hey, 
I want you to come over, bring the whole family. We're having pig slop this Saturday. We're having it. I'm going to be like, no, I'm not coming to your house because something is obviously wrong. If you were Jewish in this time, this would have been like the lowest of the low because they saw swine as unclean. And if you even got around pigs, you would have to be ceremonially cleansed before you could go back and do the things of God. And so not only is he around pigs, but his job is to feed them. And he's so hungry. He's so desperate that he's like, that slop looking kind of good. You have to be in a messed up situation for pig slop to look good to you. And so if I was telling this story to Malachi and he was, you know, acting rebellious, like all kids do sometimes. I would have stopped the story right there. See, this is what's going to happen to you if you talk crazy to your daddy again. Come up in my room talking crazy to me again, and you're going to end up like this guy right here in the pig pen wanting to eat slop. You want slop? Okay, then get out of my face because that's what's going to happen to you. But Jesus had a point to make. Jesus wanted to prove a point to the Pharisees that were listening. So he kept going. Verse 17. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Come on. The thing that sticks out to me is that he came back to his senses. He came to his senses. We're hoping that if you find yourself lost, if you find yourself in the middle of a situation that you don't know how you got there or why you got there, that you would come back to your senses. It's never too late to come back to your senses. My mom used to set us up before we would go to the grocery store, okay? So I have eight siblings, okay? So there's nine of us total, and she's a single mom, so my mama do not play. She would sit us all down in the living room before we would go to the grocery store, and she would say, okay, just like, you know, you have to give a basketball team a play to run. You have to give a football team to play or run. we basically a team at this point, so you have to give us a play to run. Or else, when seven-year-old me gets to the store, I want the Batman, I want the Superman, I want every toy that I can see. She would sit us down, and she would go, when we get to this store, you better act like you got some sense. Anybody mama ever said that to them? Okay, just, okay, we had the same mama. That's crazy. Okay. <laughs> You better act like you got some sense. And I knew what that meant. She didn't have to explain. She didn't need a whiteboard to draw it out for me. I knew that if I didn't act like I got some sense, that I would find myself in a position that I didn't want to be in. I would be in the bathroom crying or in the middle of the grocery aisle crying. I would be in a situation where I should have acted like I got some sense. And it would remind me to come back to my senses. Have you ever had one of those moments where you were like, how did I end up here? Like, how did I end up going broke? How did I end up here? How did I end up with a severed relationship with me and my dad or me and my son? How did I end up going through a divorce? And while there's no condemnation for any of those, come on, we can all find ourselves in a moment where we say, I don't know how we got here. And we can say, you know what? I can't get myself out of it. And you need a reset. I love, I love resets. I like video games because they have resets. When I'm losing, I'm unplugging the game and I'm plugging it back in if it's at my house. On Super Mario Brothers or whatever Mario Kart, you drive off of the side of the rail. Guess what? It just picks you back up and it drops you back off. It's a reset. I love resets. I wish that life had resets sometimes. Have you ever said something you were like, oh, I wish I could just grab that one and put it back in my mouth and not say that? There was a time where I really needed a lot of resets in one day, okay? And back in January or February, it snowed a lot. Y'all remember that? It snowed. And uh, I mentioned that I'm from Louisiana. So in Louisiana... If you don't know anything about Louisiana, I can tell you that there is no snow. There's not a whole lot of snow. We have swamps and we have grass. And that's pretty much the two landscapes. And it's going to rain every now and then, but it's swamps and grass and no snow. So it was snowing. And on my way to the church that morning, I was sliding a little bit, but I thought it's no big deal. I'm obviously just learning how to drive on here. My Hyundai Elantra can obviously (laughs) handle the terrain. (laughs) Come on. So then we went to service. It was all good. And for some reason, me and my wife drove separately that day, um, and service was good, and then it let out. And it seemed like as soon as service was over that the snow was just like, it's my time to shine. So it just started pouring down. And I thought to myself, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, I don't know if I can make it. But I didn't say anything because I'm a man, and, you know, men, we got to show up and show out. So I'm just like, yeah, I can handle this. It ain't nothing. So we're all in the line. Um, It's Lindsay Hill, Stephen's wife. And then my wife is behind her in the line. And then Stephen Hill is is after her. And then I'm at the back, okay? If anything goes wrong, I'm like, I'm the caboose, okay? And so 
I was like, I think, I think we can make it. There was a longer route, but I was like, I'm not going the longer route. I'm going the shorter route, and it had a little bit of a hill. But I thought, no problem. I'm sure the snow will melt or something will happen where we can make it, okay? So we get to the bottom of this hill. Um, well, Lindsay gets to the bottom of this hill, and she calls Stephen. Hey, I don't think I can make it. Now, I'm doing the calculations. Her car is about the same size as my car. So now I'm starting to get really nervous that I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. But I'm like, surely, you know, it's Lindsay. Maybe she could just turn it a little bit. Stephen will figure it out. Then I call my wife. Hey, do you think you're going to be able to make it? She has a completely different tone. My wife is super confident. She's like, yeah, I grew up here. I've been here five years. I've never seen this much snow, but I'm just going along with it. Yeah, I, I grew up here. I can make it. I'm like, all right, baby, if you think you can make it, go ahead with your bad self. Make it. A few moments later, I get a call from my man, Stephen Hill. Hello? Yeah. Uh, Sydney is sliding down the hill sideways. <laughs> so she obviously could not make it. <laughs> and so here we are in all of our gas-saving cars. They get like 30 miles to the gallon. And we cannot get anywhere. And so Stephen's like, I think it's a good idea if we would just pull off to the side. And I'm like, oh, you think? Yes, yes. <laughs> Let's pull off to the side. I wish I had a redo at this moment. And we end up having to call Pastor Stephen to come in his truck because he has a truck. Obviously, he doesn't care about gas mileage, but he has a truck. So when it snows, he is, he's there and he's ready. So we call him. He's like, man, y'all couldn't make it. I'm like, well, you see, my car is like this close from the ground and yours is like this close from the ground. So please come and save us, good sir. <laughs> So he comes, and he gets all the women and children first. Come on, because we're chivalrous gentlemen, freezing outside. And he takes them. And then we come back, and their one small problem is we only brought one set of keys. We have three vehicles that we need to grab. So we have to make another trip and another trip. And at this moment, I'm like, I need a reset. Right now, please, I could just go back, go back in time and go the other way. We would have been home. I would have been warm, and I would have been sipping hot cocoa by now. But here I am in the cold. So here's this prodigal son, and he's saying, I need a reset with my dad. I need to go back. It's better in my house. It's better in my father's house than it is by myself. And maybe you need a reset today. Maybe, come on, you need to go back and have a conversation with your father. And I can almost hear him, come on, hyping himself up. Because he, start, he starts going over this spill. He, he, say, he says, I'm going to go to my father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He's like, okay, 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 okay. I can do it. That was a little too hype, but I, I think I can do it. I can go to my dad, and, and I can say it to him. I don't know how he's going to respond because the dad could have just said, hey, get off my property. I don't know you anymore. You took half of the estate. I'm done with you. The father could have said, hey, somebody come jump this man. <laughs> he is on my property, and I do not know him. The father could have had a lot of responses, and we can be afraid of our father's response. But instead, he's just waiting to welcome us back in. So never be afraid to get up and go to your father. You can get up right now, no matter what you did this week, no matter what you've done with your life. There's nothing you can do that's too bad to where you can't. Come on, come to your senses and get up and go back to the father. And somebody ought to be clapping right now because we all have found ourselves in a situation where I had to come back to my senses and I had to get up. You can have a reset. Verse 20, as we keep reading it, says... But while he was still a long way off, look at your neighbor and say, a long way off. Oh, say it like you mean it, a long way off. His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. While he was still a long way off. Come on, some of us know who God has called us to be. Some of us know where we should be. Some of us know like we've been living raggedy and ratchet and crazy, but we're still a long way off. We're still not quite there. And I'm grateful that we serve a God that doesn't sit and wait and say, hey, when you get right here, then I'll be able to heal you. Then I'll be able to come to you. But he says, while you're still a long way off, I see you. There's not a trip you can take. There's not a plane you can hop on. There's not a train you can hop on that will take you far enough away from me to where I don't see you. There's not a room that's dark enough that God can't step in and bring light to. So I don't know where you're at today, but you are not too far for God to see you. Because while he was a long way off, the father saw him. God sees you, and he had compassion on him. So God is not sitting waiting to catch you in your mistakes. God is not waiting on you to come home so that he can spank you or chastise you or whatever it is. God is literally wanting to love you. God is waiting on you so that he 
can love you. I can picture this father having a spot where he sat every day and looked. Because in order to see the son coming, he had to be looking for him. I know that's basic, but he had to be looking for his son. So I imagine every day after the son left, he would have a spot and he would go there and he would just sit and he would look and he would wait and he would say to himself, maybe today is the day that my son is going to come home. Maybe today is the day that my son is going to come home. And day by day, he didn't come home. And then week after week, he didn't come home. And maybe it was months. Maybe it was years. The Bible doesn't say how long it was. But finally, his son came. And that's how God feels about you. And we can think that God is everywhere, which he is everywhere. And he's all the time, and he's outside of time, and he's big, and he's, he's this big figure. And yes, all of that is true, but he's also concerned with you. Yeah. So while he has a lot going on, he doesn't have too much going on that he overlooks you. He has every hair on your head counted. Come on, he loves you, he sees you, and he's waiting for you. He's sitting, and he's waiting for you to come to him. And on the day that his sons or his daughter comes home, come on, he's going to run out, and he's going to run to you, and he's going to wrap his arms around you, and he's going to kiss you, and he's going to say, I've been waiting for you. It's not, oh, I'm, I'm so nervous to go back to my dad because I don't know what he's going to say. It's, no, I can't wait to get back to my father's house because of how much he loves me. Verse 21, the son said to him, he's going to go into his spiel now that he's been practicing. Father, I sinned against heaven and I sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. See, the father didn't care about the little script that the son had rehearsed. He never had intentions of making the son feel bad. And even though it was true that the son had sinned against heaven and against his father, the father never wanted him to wear shame because of it. In fact, all he was waiting to do was to put his identity back on him. All he wanted to do was welcome him back into the family. He couldn't wait to say, hey, you're not a servant. Come on, you want to be a higher servant? No, you are my son. And so let's look at the things that he gave his son. First, he gave him a robe. Come on, this robe was not just any robe, but it was the best robe. There's a story in the Old Testament about a kid getting the best robe, getting a favored robe. And the brothers did not like that. Joseph got a robe from his dad, and they were like, oh, so you want to be the favorite. We're about to kill you. <laughs> so this showed that the father had placed favor on him. It showed that the father wanted to cover him up. He didn't want to ashamed him. But Jesus says, when you come to me, he's going to clothe you in his righteousness. Come on, he's going to give you favor. He says, I favor you, I love you, and I've been waiting for you to come back. So it's not just come back and now, good thing that you're back in the house. But no, I'm going to restore everything that you feel like you lost. The ring has two parts. The first thing is a ring identifies that somebody belongs to somebody else, okay? When you see this ring on my finger, you know, oh, he taken, okay? <laughs> he has a wife. Come on, he is taken. He belongs to somebody else. When you see her ring, just know, young single men, don't talk to my wife because we will throw down, okay? I'm just saying, don't let the jacket fool you. It will come off. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just playing. That was flesh. Forgive me. But it signifies that this person belongs to somebody. It's an identity, the second thing with this particular ring is back then, come on, if you had your father's ring, come on, that let people know, come on, I have authority in my father's house, I have ownership in my father's house, and actually you could take that ring, it would have been engraved, you could take it to the market, and you could get stuff, and you could stamp it into some wax, and that was a way to say, hey, my father's going to handle this, my father's going to pay this back. So when you come back to your father, when you come back to your heavenly father, you're not just coming back as a broken person, but he actually restores you and sets you up better than you've ever been before. Come on, he gives you authority, and so whatever you speak, come on, on earth will be so in heaven. So if you lose something on earth, it'll be loose in heaven. If you bound something on earth, it'll be bound in heaven because you have access. He doesn't just give you, come on, a place to sleep. Come on, he gives you access. And this son actually finds himself in a situation that was better than before he left because now he has access to it all. Instead of just having his half, his father has given him access to it all. So God doesn't just accept us. He blesses us forward. He sets us up better than when we left. And then he gives him some sandals. And I mostly think that's just because he was barefoot. <laughs> and so you have to be down bad to have to sell your shoes <laughs> to keep going. I've, I've had to eat a lot of ramen noodles in my day. Come on, I had to make the, make the AC a little warmer than I wanted to be to save some money. But I've never had to sell the shoes off of my feet to make it. And so the father is saying, hey, you can walk alongside me. And I got some protection for you. Here, put these on your feet. You're my son. No, feet, no son of mine are going to walk around with bare feet. And so all that he does, he's basically saying, hey, son. You're not going to be a servant in my house. I'm not going to hire you to do some stuff. No, you're my son. Why would I do that? I'm going to distinguish you as a son. And it's the same way when we come back to our father. And so he continues, verse 23. 
Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Okay, this father is going overboard. A fattened calf is like enough to feed the whole village. It's enough to feed the whole block. Like we just threw a third birthday party and I got hot dogs. I didn't get a fattened calf. Maybe when he graduates college, he'll get a fattened calf. But for right now, we got hot dogs. This is overboard. He could have did a goat. He could have did a lamb. He could have killed a lot of other things. But he said, get the fattest calf that we have and let's kill it. Because my son, who was dead, not just lost, but he was dead, he's back to life. So when you step out of what God has for you, it's not just that you're a bad person or that you're lost. It's not God turning you from a bad to a good person. It's you were dead and now you've been made alive again. And that's something that heaven thinks is worth celebrating. This is where the story shifts from where this is where the story shifts from the other two stories. See, the the shepherd threw a party for his sheep and the woman threw a party for her coin. But the story continues here because Jesus is still trying to get the Pharisees to see something that they don't see yet. So verse 25 says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. And so while this father, who no doubt had had conversations with his older son about what they would do when the younger son came back, while this father, who had spent all this time with his older son, was excited, and this was the best day of his life, and this was one of the most exciting. It was a party. Come on, the fattened calf. If it's me, I'm going in the party strictly off the fact that the food is going to be good. I don't care what we're (laughs) celebrating. I'm going to eat. But he's so mad that he can't even step in. He can't even go in. He's salty. He's upset that there's a party for his good-for-nothing brother, and he refuses to go inside. So his father went out and pleaded with him, verse 29. But he answered his father, look, All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. The one thing that I want to point out before I talk about the son, the older son, is that the father, just like he went out and ran out for the lost son, he also went out and pleaded with the son who was already in his house. He's, he also pursued him. And so we can find ourselves in either one of these, in the shoes of either one of these sons. But it's good to know that God comes after both. He doesn't just pick one or the other, but he comes after both. Have you ever been so mad at somebody that even when they invite you into something fun that you really, really like, you're just going to be stubborn and you're going to act like you don't like it? Like they're like, hey, after lunch, us and all the friends, we're going to Popeye's. And you're like, I don't even like Popeye's. Let me just tell you, if you feel like I'm mad at you, And you can offer me some Popeyes? Come on, all can be forgiven. I don't care what you do. If you give me Popeyes, we are good in my book. All is forgiven. Come on, one of your friends hurt your feeling, and so now y'all doing game night, and you know this is your favorite game. You know you love Uno. But everybody playing Uno, and you just over there standing at your car, it's like, hmm, draw four. Like, you're being stubborn, and we've all been there where somebody hurt our feelings, and we're like, you know what? Even though I enjoy that thing, even though I know I would have a ton of fun with that thing, I'm not going to go and be a part. And this son is doing the same thing. He's outside. He's throwing a pity party because he's upset that here he is thinking that he has found the way to his father's heart. He's found the way to access his father, but apparently he's got it wrong because both sons just wanted their father's things. The younger son was just more honest and upfront about it. He was just like, give it to me now, and I'm going to leave and get away. But the older son said, you know what? If I slave for him, if I obey everything that he says, and I never make a mistake, then maybe I can earn my father's love, and maybe he'll throw a party for me. We can be like that brother. We can come into church if we're not careful, and we will have a spiritual to-do list. We will say, if I'll just attend, and I'll just give, and I'll just serve every time the doors are open, and I'll just do everything that they ask me to do, which all of those things are lovely and awesome, and I think that you should, be, you should do all of those, that doesn't earn you God's love. God's love is crazy because you can't earn it and you can't lose it. And that's probably why we have a hard time grasping it, because we like to control stuff. 
We like to have things in our control. But before you got saved, God loved you the same amount as he does right now after you've gotten saved. Before you got that promotion at work, God loved you then and he loves you now. Before you jumped on the dream team and started serving, God loved you then and he loves you now. Because there's nothing you can do to gain it, but that also means that there's nothing you can do to lose it. And I'm grateful that we have a father that we can't lose his love. So his son says, I've been slaving and I never disobeyed. And he treated obedience like something he had to do when it should have been treated like something he gets to do. And so instead of being worried about doing everything that his dad says to not make a mistake, to get what was his, I think the father would have loved if he would have been this whole time making room for his brother to come back. Hey, dad, I know he left, but guess what? I'm working my side of the field because I know my brother's going to come back for his. Hey, dad, I know that the son's gone, so there's more to do. So I can do a little bit more for you. I can serve you a little bit more. I can be a part, not because I want anything from you, but just because I want to have the same heart that you have. I want to have the same view on life that you have. I want to see your son the same way that you see your son. So here the father has to give him a download on verse, on verse 31. He says, my son, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours, he was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So the father immediately places identity back on him. He says, you know what? You don't have to slay for me. You don't have to obey everything I say. You're my son. My son. You're my son. And some of us need to hear that today. You are a son and a daughter Come on, you're not a slave. You don't have to obey. You don't have to try to get it right all the time for God to love you. He already loves you. Now, I'm not saying go and live wild and crazy. But what I'm saying is that you are already a son and a daughter. The father is trying to download to the older son what the culture of their family is going to be. If you come to my house, you're going to experience what the culture of my family is. We, we loud, we like to have fun until about 9.30, and then it's a, it's a hard cutoff. I'll just go, I'll just go to sleep. I, wherever I'm at, I'm going to go to sleep. 9.30, 9.45, if you're lucky. If it's a Friday, 9.45. But any other day of the week, 9.30. If you go to Stephen Hill's house, it's going to be a whole different culture. They're going to be in there singing because they got awesome voices and stuff and playing music, and you're going to feel like you walked into the gates of heaven. There's a culture for your family. And this father is saying, hey, here's the culture of our family. When someone leaves and is dead, when they come back to life, we're going to celebrate. We, ha- we have to do that. And he's trying to show the son his actual heart. Because up until this point, both of the sons have been after his hand and not his heart. And we can do that with God. We can say, God, if you'll just heal me, come on, I'll never sin again. Come on, anybody ever made those promises to God? Like, if you get me out of this one, <laughs> I'll never do what I did to get here again. Yes, you will. <laughs> You're going to do it. It's okay. We'll say, God, if you'll just bless me financially, God, if you'll just fix my marriage, God, if you'll just, and we're after the hand of God, which God loves to do those things, and he loves to give good gifts to his children. But what he loves even more is when you come to him and you want his heart. You want a real, authentic relationship with him. You want to see people the way that he sees them. And so as we're closing today, and Ben, you guys can go ahead and come up. I don't think this story is just about one lost son or one prodigal son, but it's actually about a relational father that had two lost sons. They both were lost. One was just physically closer. So you can be physically in church and still be as distant as somebody who's on the street. Because you can make it about what you do for God versus who God is to you. They both needed the Father. At the end of the day, both of them needed the Father to get up and go out to them. They both needed the Father to say, hey, you're my son. They both need the Father to say, hey, I love you. And we all need the Father. And so be careful that you don't get so far on this side of the Son where, you know, I'm saved. I look good. I comb my hair now. I serve at the church. And you start to look at other people like, how dare they? And so we start, what happens is we start to have people come to our church who don't look like you and who don't think like you and who don't smell like heavenly things. And you're starting to say, oh, I can't believe they came to the church today. When you really need to be saying, I can't believe they came to the church today. We need more people like them. I can't wait until we have a whole row of people like them because God wants to do something in their life. And I know that my father is in heaven throwing a party. So I'm just going to make a place right now for the party to happen at the house because God is after the one. When sinners show up, come on, God shows out. And so we should be doing that. And you can find yourself in either one of the seats. You could be the lost son who left or you can be the son who stayed but never got it. Because I've been both. 
I grew up in a single parent home with, with nine kids, okay? So we didn't grow up going to church. We didn't grow up in a Christian household. We didn't have like family values that were like, we're going to be these type of people. So me and my older brother, I'm the second oldest, we just started doing whatever we wanted to. And as you can imagine, at 13, 14, 15, doing whatever you want to do is not a good uh, scope for life. So it didn't land us in the best place. And so as I got to high school, I couldn't help but to feel lost. I couldn't help but to feel like, I don't know what I'm going to do, what's my next step, other than I just want to have fun. And I didn't really know my earthly dad, and so I thought that about God. I thought if I had an earthly dad, then I could probably work on an idea of a heavenly father. But how could I have a heavenly father who's good and who loves me when my earthly dad is kind of in and out, kind of I don't even know the dude. And we all do that. If you had a bad relationship with your dad, then you put that on God. You say, oh, my dad was in and out. He said promises that he never fulfilled. He was abusive. He was this. He was that. And you can easily go, oh, that must be what God is like. But God is not like any earthly father that has ever lived. God is perfect. Come on. When you need to be loved, he loves you. When you need to be corrected, he corrects you because God is a perfect father so you can come to him. And so I got to high school and I had this friend who would invite me to church over and over and over. And in my mind, I was like, I am not the type of person you want at your church. <laughs> if I go to your youth group, oh, the youth pastor is going to fall down. <laughs> the, buildings are, the building is going to come down because I am not the type of person that goes to church. But finally, just to get her to stop asking me, if I'm being honest with you, I said, you know what? I'll go to one of your stupid church things. Just, I'm just going to go this one time. And that night, it happened to be Pastor Stephen preaching at this youth event, and I got saved that night. And it changed my whole life. And I found, my, I realized that, hey, I'm in the mud. I'm in the pig pen. Come on. I'm looking at pig slop thinking that it's good. I'm looking at this thing that's going to make me depressed and thinking it's going to bring me joy. I'm looking at this thing that's going to make me anxious thinking that it's going to bring me peace. I'm looking at things that are not good for me, and I'm so down that I think they will be good for me. But I would love to stop right there and just say, yeah, I was the prodigal, and I ran back to God, and I've never sinned again. But I've also been the other son. That when people come into church or when I meet people and they think differently than me, they look differently than me, they want to argue with me about something that I feel like they shouldn't really be arguing with me about, I want to say, oh, you must not be saved, saved. <laughs> you, mu you must be a new Christian. I want to judge them. And we've all done that. And I don't feel like we're one or the other only, but we swing on this pendulum back and forth. And what that reminds us, it keeps us humble because that lets us know that we need the Father. The Father is the one that brings us into alignment with his heart. And so today you can find yourself in both of those shoes. And I want to worship a little bit. So if you guys will stand up with me. I wonder if there's anybody who would be honest and say, you know what? Right now, I'm a little bit of the prodigal. I've been living wild. I've been living reckless. I took what I thought I needed and I ran from God. But now I'm back and I just want to be a part of the family again. Or you're the second brother. And you can say, you know what? I've been a little bit more judgmental than I need to be. I've been a little bit too hard. I've been coming to church because I feel like it's a spiritual to-do list and that God doesn't like me if I don't do it. I haven't been coming to church because I love God. God can restore both of those things today. And so you guys worship with us. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am. wherever we find ourselves today. Whether we're far away off, God, or whether we're in your house and we just don't get it, that you would meet us right where we're at. That people would meet the Father today. For real this time. That we wouldn't just know your hand, we wouldn't just know the hand of God, but that we would know the heart of God. God, that you would give us eyes to see people like you see them. God, if we do find ourselves in a situation where we feel stuck, 
where we feel like we're at the lowest low in our lives. Jesus, in you, there's a reset. We can come to you today. You can heal us. You can restore us. You can set us back to where we belong. You can place us in relationship with the Father. God, there's no amount of work we need to do. There's no checklist we need to fulfill first. We don't need to clean ourselves up and get all the pig slop off of us before we come back to your house. You have a robe and a ring waiting for every person in this room. God, we love you, and we thank you for what you're doing in our lives in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. All my life, all my life you have been such a good word well i hope that it spoke right to where you're at today and it encouraged you and inspired you to take a next step in your faith if it did go ahead and text the house to 94,000 right now we want to journey with you as you take this next step in your faith well that's all we have for you today so thank you again for joining us we love you and we can't wait to see you again soon